minds might be at peace and our will might be energized to continue to persevere until our change come in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we're going to be looking at the seven cries that were uttered by Jesus from the cross during his crucifixion. And what we will see as we listen to Jesus crying from the cross is that he was not some deranged individual, but he was in total control of his mental faculties. He was in total control of what was taking place, as will be reflected by what he says from the cross. Now, some of you have probably had the unenviable assignment of having to be at the deathbed of a loved one, a family member, or a friend. And you can know, you know that under heavy medication that people can sometimes be out of their mind. And even if they're not under heavy medication, just the pain or the disillusionment that sets in as the body is weakening, it can cause someone to say things that doesn't make sense. Uh, they might speak to people from their childhood. Uh, they might speak to a situation or a circumstance that uh, you have long forgotten, but in the recesses of their mind, it's still there. That was not the case with Jesus. Even though he lost a tremendous amount of blood, even though he was dehydrated, even though he was at the very point of death, being the God, man, being perfect God and perfect man, we see he's in total control. And on the cross, we see his divinity as well as his humanity crying out. And we will see that as we look at each of these particular cries from the cross. The first one we looked at on last week, and we will give them in chronological order. None of the gospel gives all seven, so you must have look at all four gospels to get the complete picture of the seven cries of Jesus. The first one was, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing, Luke 23, 34. That cry actually began as they were nailing him to the cross. And we saw last week that he kept on saying, he kept on repeating, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And last week we saw that this speaks to Jesus, the God-man, the one who was sent to seek and to save that which was lost. So Jesus, even during his crucifixion, during his execution, he was true to his mission. And that was to seek and to save the lost. And so he prays a prayer, a determined plea he makes, even for his executioners and those responsible for his execution, that the Father would not hold this sin to their charge, that God would not judge them, and the judgment that their acts merited was death. But had God killed them men there on the mountain of Calvary, it meant they would not have an opportunity to repent. So Jesus, in essence, was not saying, Father, give them blanket forgiveness, let them into heaven. What he was saying, Father, do not judge them now. Give them an opportunity to repent. Do not give them what they deserve right now. Because Jesus knew that some would believe after his death, burial, and resurrection. And so we see his compassion for the lost. His compassion for the lost. And I don't care what a church is doing, I don't care what the membership is, I don't care what the offering is, if the church does not have a compassion for the lost, the church does not have the heart of Jesus. Because the heart of Jesus is for the lost. And one of the great challenges for the church is to move away from this narcissistic approach to ministry. To believe in that everything is designed for them and everything is for them. You know, narcissist was a person preoccupied with himself and looking into the water, he would see his reflection. He, he became so enamored with himself, with his reflection of water, he actually fell into the water and he drowned. The church can fall into love with its own self, can fall in love with worship. God never called us to worship worship. We're to worship God. But if we're not careful, we'll fall in love with worship with the enthusiasm, with the exuberance, with the ambiance, with the energy of a spirited worship service. And so we're like the apostles who stood on the mountain of, 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 of uplift when Jesus was ascended, and they stood there just gazing up into heaven. And the angel came back and said, you men of Galilee, why are you standing here gazing up to the heaven? This same Jesus who has ascended will descend in like manner. The work is down in the valley. Jesus had a passion for the Lord church without a passion for the lost is a church that's on the road to being apostate. And I've 
all the doctrine right, all the theology right, all the clubs, all the auxiliary, and all of that going on, but if there's no passion for the law, then the life of Christ is not pulsating in the membership because the whole reason that the church exists is that God will have a venue through which he can manifest himself, yes, in worship, but he can manifest himself in terms of having people that will be used by the Lord to share the gospel, to seek and to save the lost. And we see this in the life of Jesus. The second cry supports the first cry. In the first cry, he pleads to his father to forgive his executioners. Don't hold this in a charge. In the second cry, he's responding to the plea, to a desperate plea of the dying thief. And the two thieves both were in unison initially at ridiculing and mocking Jesus with the rest of the people that were there. Then one of the thieves come to himself and he says, look, we deserve what we are receiving. We, we, we did the crime and now here is our punishment. But he looks at Jesus and he says, but this man has done nothing wrong. And so the thief who repents says, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. Remember me. We looked at that last week. One point I want to make about that this morning is that the thief, as we said last week, accept the responsibility for his sin, accept the responsibility for the consequences of his sin, and he also acknowledges the sin and perfection of Christ when he says, this man has done nothing wrong. He also believed that Jesus would be raised from the dead because he says, Lord, when you come into your kingdom. And so he, he knew that Jesus was being executed with he and the other thief, but he believed that Jesus was going to come into a kingdom. So Jesus responds by saying, truly, he says, amen. You can count on it. I guarantee it. Today, not tomorrow, not next week. But today you should be with me in paradise. The tense of the verb that the thief there used, that the, the writer Luke uses to describe what the thief said, in the Greek text, remember, the tense of that verb is in what's called the eros imperative. And the eros imperative, it carries the idea of you make a decision right now. But that decision right now will have a consequence after a while. And so what he is saying to Jesus, Jesus, make a decision right now that you're going to remember me when you come in your kingdom. Make a decision right now, but the decision you make right now would have consequence after a while. Remember me, Lord, and make that decision now so that when you come into your kingdom, you remember me. Now, as I was thinking about that again this week, it's kind of interesting. We sometimes say the wrong thing. We reinforce the negative. We tell somebody, don't forget. <laughs> don't forget. A double negative. Don't and forget. Instead of saying, remember, the positive. Now, my Bethany had it right. When she said, Dad, don't forget the double negative to remember. Because what she wanted to leave me with was remember. Leave me with remember. Have you ever been trying to think of something that you couldn't remember? You had forgot it. Now you're trying to remember it. And so he says to Jesus, Lord, I just want you to remember me when you come in your kingdom. But Jesus says, you get more than just remembrance. Because of your repentance and because of your faith and because of your belief, you're going to go in with me into paradise, a place of comfort for those who die to later be resurrected at the resurrection of the just. So these two first cries deal with people being saved. It deals with giving people the opportunity to be saved. Those who execute Jesus, he says, praise for mercy that they not be judged so that they may believe later. The one who does believe, he gets salvation right there while he's hanging on the cross beside Jesus. So those are the first two cries. Now in this third cry, Jesus deals with his last earthly responsibility. These first two cries deals with his divinity. And as God, he can offer salvation. As God, he can offer requests, forgiveness of his father. But this third cry, it deals with his last earthly responsibility. And so the third cry deals with his perfect humanity. Are you following? His perfect humanity. Now, y'all got, got to go to bed at night so your minds can be quick early. In John chapter 19, if you turn over to John, John's gospel, and as I said earlier, the seven uh, last cries of Jesus 
uh, all seven of them are not in any one gospel. And so each gospel writer has a particular thing that he is emphasizing, but when you get all seven of them together, you see this beautiful mosaic of Jesus on the cross, in total control, not a deranged man fighting, trying to keep from dying. So the third cry, John chapter 19, and watch what he says. Verse 26, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, standing nearby he said to his mother woman behold your son then he said to the disciple behold your mother and from that hour that disciple took her into his own household this is profound you read the bible too fast you got to slow down the speed bumps in the text jesus here is taking care of his last earthly responsibility Mother was his mother. Mary was his mother. He had been conceived in her womb of the Holy Spirit. Nine months she had carried him, gave birth to him, nurtured, nursed him, nurtured him, brought him to manhood. Now Mary is now a, a widow. Her husband Joseph has died. In the Hebrew culture, as in many cultures, if the mother dies, the eldest son has responsibility for taking care of his mother. No SSI, no Social Security, no 401k, no IRA. The eldest son has responsibility for taking care of his mother. But there's one problem. Jesus didn't have a bank account. As a matter of fact, unlike the foxes, he didn't have a hole to lay in. Unlike the birds of the air, he didn't have a nest to rest in. But he has responsibility to care for his mother, and he has responsibility to ensure that his mother is cared for until he dies. That is his earthly human responsibility as a firstborn son. Now watch this. He had to be the God-man. On the cross, dying, he's cognizant of the fact, I have a responsibility to my widowed mother. She has nobody to care for her. What, Jesus, you got three brothers? At least three biological brothers, James, the writer of the New New Testament epistle of James, Jude, the writer of the epistle of Jude, and another brother named Joseph. He had three biological brothers. But Jesus says, I'm the firstborn. I'm responsible for taking care of my mother, but not only responsible for taking care of her, but making sure that she gets the best possible care that can be offered to her. Now watch this. Watch this. Even though he has three biological brothers, his three biological brothers, they are godly men according to the Jewish standard of being godly. They had been to the synagogue. That was Jesus' custom. That was his family's custom. They went to the Jewish feast. According to Jewish standards, they were godly men. But the problem is they had not accepted the full revelation of God. Watch this. During Jesus' earthly ministry, none of his biological brothers believed that he was the Messiah. As a matter of fact, in John chapter 7, when he said he was going to the feast, his brother says he's out of his mind. They thought he was deranged. So what Jesus said is, my mother is used to having godly care. Her father was a godly man. I believe there's enough in the text to suggest that. Mary's mother had to be a godly man to raise such a godly woman. Mary married Joseph, who was a godly man, because the Bible says he was a just man not willing to put her away to make her a public example. He was a godly man. Jesus was the God-man in human flesh. So Jesus says, my mother has always had a godly man to trust in. My mother's already had a godly man for support. So Jesus says, even though I know after my burial and my resurrection, he knew as God his biological brothers would believe in him. But Jesus says, not even for three days while I'm in the ground do I want my mother to have any anxiety, any frustration. I want her to have the best possible care that she could have. So he says to his mother, Mary, look at your son. And he handpicked, watch this, for three and a half years, I believe that the primary thing that Jesus was doing for John was to train John to take care of his mother. So there they stand at the cross of Calvary, and there is Mary and the other Marys, Jesus' three biological brothers, they're not there. But John the Apostle is there. 
And so Jesus says, John, you have responsibility for my mom. The only thing, the, the thing on this earth that meant the most to Jesus was his mama. And so he commits his mama to the care of the most godly man that he knew. A man that he had spent three and a half years with training. Now that'll tell us something about how we think of our parents. In this self-centered, narcissistic age in which we live, we are trying to abdicate our responsibility of taking care of our parents. We owe them at least 22 years, at least. At least that much. If we got to drive old raggedy cars, beat up automobiles, and wear secondhand clothes for our parents to get the best possible care, that's what we ought to do. And not buy into this selfishness of this society. Y'all don't want to hear this. I tell you what, the one thing about my wife, I have never seen anybody that I know that love their mother more than my wife loves her mother. I don't know nobody that loves their mother more than my wife loves her mother. In a way, I envy that because I wish my mama was here that I could love her the way my wife loves her mother. Not a not a negative thing, but a positive thing. To see that type of love and devotion that a daughter has for a mother. And so we get so ethereal with our religion, and we forget the main point. The religion really does start at home. And the responsibility we have to those who can't take care of themselves, and in many cases it's our parents who become aged and infirmed physically and mentally, and we want to buy into the society's uh, a philosophy that says, well, you know, you've done all you can know, you ain't done all you can do. No, you haven't done all you can do until you've done all you can do. No matter what it costs. No matter what the sacrifice is. And that's the example that Jesus lays down right here in this text. So a dying man on the cross is preoccupied. I've got to make sure my mother is taken care of. When I leave here, i got three brothers, but they're not godly enough to take care of my mom. So he commits to, this is perfect man here, y'all. This is perfect humanity speaking out from the cross. This is the heart of a son that is connected to his mama's heart. And so he says, woman, behold your son. He says to John, the beloved one, behold your mother. And the text is profound. It says from that day, John took her into his house and cared for her like she was his own. I could, I could stay right here for a long time, but I'm not going to do it. I think y'all got the point. The fourth cry, we got to go look at Matthew's gospel. The first two we see as the Savior who's pleading for souls. The second one as the God-man. He's taking care of his last earthly responsibility. He leaves nothing Undone. He leaves no unfinished business, you see. But the fourth plea is interesting. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew is his major theme is to present Jesus as the king of the Jews. And you know that. And then the Bible says in verse 45, and from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. From 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, a total eclipse. A total eclipse from 12 o'clock midday when the sun reaches its peak, when it should be the light it is going to be, it was totally dark from 12 to 3. And about the ninth hour, at about 3 o'clock, Jesus cries out with a loud voice, said, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatani. That is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now watch this. The first two is God. The next two is perfect man. And even a perfect man who is perfectly innocent, when he senses that he has been forsaken, he cries out to the only one that can help him. He cries out to the only one who can help him, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now watch this. Jesus, as perfect man, did not have a written promise like we have, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. 
So on the cross there now in his sin bearing, y'all, God can't die. So in dying death, he's dying as a man. He's dying as a perfect man. And so as a perfect man, in his perfect innocence, he's crying out to God, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in that, I see faith. The faith is this, that if I am being forsaken, or if it appears I'm being forsaken, there's a reason for it. And God knows. And God only knows. And some of us become so spiritual, and we talk such spiritual jargon that we fail to admit there are times that we feel like our souls have been forsaken. And we read the word and we pray, and we ask others to pray to, for us, to help us pray us back, to realize we haven't been forsaken. But I don't know about you, there have been times when I felt in my humanity, as a man, I felt forsaken. As a man, I felt all alone, all by myself. As an imperfect man. So perfect man understands that whatever God does, there's a reason for it. So he cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Innocence only appeals to the one trusted. A cry of faith without a written promise, still believing and crying out to God. But there was no audible response. Sometimes you cry to God, and there's no audible response. And sometimes you cry out to God, and there is no apparent change in the situation or circumstance. But God works in the creases of life, you see. God works in the creases of life. When we fold stuff together, nobody really noticed that stuff in the creases. And God is at work in the creases of life. And God is at work even during those silent moments because when God works, he didn't have to make a whole lot of noise. Y'all. He didn't have to make a whole lot of noise to work. So God is working even when there is apparent silence or the appearance of silence. God is still at work. And so the fifth plea as I hasten to close, takes me back to John's gospel. Verse 28. Verse 19. Chapter 19, verse 28. John chapter 19, verse 28. Now, you you study these on your own, and you see how they're linked together like beautiful pearls on a string. So John 19, 28. We have the fifth cry from the Father. After this, and what John doesn't record is the my God from my God cry. He records, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. And then between that was my God, my God. And then John records, Verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I'm thirsty. Again, the profundity of the text is the simplicity. It is in the details. It's where the text explodes with profound illumination. John says that Jesus realized and fully cognizant of the fact that everything he was supposed to do, he had done. Every single thing that he was supposed to do was accomplished. But yet, there was one little obscure passage in Psalm 69, 21, where the psalmist had prophesied that they would give him vinegar to drink. That's the only thing that had not been fulfilled that was written in the scripture that had to be fulfilled, and so fulfilled to fulfill this last little prophecy. He says, I'm thirsty. Before that, they had tried to offer him the vinegar, but he wouldn't take it. Because he wouldn't take the sour vinegar, which was sort of a, a sedative to keep the executed one from going into shock so they would maintain consciousness and have to endure the horror and the pain and the agony of crucifixion. He wouldn't take it to ease the pain. But now that the work is all done to fulfill the scripture, he said, I'm thirsty. The 
Bible says they take a, a sponge, so like a sponge, a, a kisser, and they dip it in the sour vinegar, and they put it up to his mouth, and he takes it to fulfill the prophecy. And then John 19, 29, or John 19, 30, when Jesus therefore had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. To tell us that. It's accomplished. Now this is not the mindset of a deranged person who's lost his senses, who's lost his faculties. The text is trying to show us is that Jesus was in total control of his mental faculties up until the very second that he gave up his last breath. And so until he said it's finished, it wasn't finished. But when he said it is finished, he had accomplished everything that God sent him to the earth to do. Everything he was supposed to do, he did. Every person he was supposed to heal, God healed. Every sermon that was supposed to be preached was preached. He caring for his mother, all the details of scripture, and he says, to tell us that, it's accomplished. It's finished. And the Holy Spirit moves John to write that so that we can see in the details that God is in the details. And we've coined the phrase, this is not true. We said the devil is in the details. No, the devil is not in the details. God is in the details. God is the one that ties all the details together, the specifics of things together, so we can see that God is at work. Because only a, a creator, the, the creator, the uncaused cause, the first cause for all the facts, the scientists might say, only that one can know all of the details. And so God knows all the details, and so God gives us detailed things. And he strings little details in the text to let us know that I inspired the men to write these words because I am the God of the text. Well, when we close, we go back to Luke's gospel. And after saying it is Luke 23, and after saying to tell us that it's accomplished, Jesus had one more thing to say. He had one more thing to say. Verse 46 of John chapter 23. Now watch it just again. It's in the detail. Luke writes, Luke 23, 46, and Jesus crying out with a loud voice. You read the text too fast. How many times have you seen someone on their deathbed about ready to die a few seconds away from death be able to cry out with a loud voice, have the energy or the strength to cry out. But Luke writes this to let us know that ultimately nobody was taking his life. He was giving his life up. So he had strength even in the last seconds. Had he wanted to, he could have came down from the cross. So just to show everybody I'm still in control, Luke writes, he cries out with a loud voice. So that all that were in earshot could hear what he had to say. And what he in essence is saying is, Father, I'm now giving my life back to you. It is into your hands I commend my spirit. Into your hands I commend my spirit. And it gets better than that. Because if you read the other gospel writers, they said that he then lowered his head the literal translation is he pillowed his head. <laughs> Again, the detail. <laughs> the writer, the, the, the original translation in, in Matthew Mark's gospel about what he did with his head is not that when he died he dropped his head like you see on television. No, the text says he pillowed his head. Because a man who was dying on his own terms, a man who was dying on his own time, and a man who was dying under his own power, controls all of the situations and the particulars of his death. So he cries out with a loud voice so they might know I still got energy. Father, in your hand I commend my, my spirit. And then he lays his head down. He pillows his head in the locks of his shoulder. As he had already said, no man takes my life, but I give it so that I can pick it back up again. This is the Christ of God. And the text is the word of God. 
as you study the text diligently, you'll see that God weaves details into the text to distinguish the text just from somebody's opinion. Because there's no way human beings could cover all of the bases and all the tracks to connect all the Old Testament prophecies to make sure they got fulfilled in minute detail in the life and ministry of Jesus up to and including his crucifixion. So even in, even in crucifixion, even in crucifixion, he's exalted as the Christ of God. He dies like no other man has ever died. He says things in death that no man has ever uttered since, before or since. He shows that he's in total control. And in dying, he shows his compassion for the lost. Fulfilling his mission. That's why we call it the Passion Week. Because we see all through the last week of Jesus, his passion for lost souls. I want to encourage you to do something this week. To really be in prayer about people, family members, and as well as co-workers and friends who, who you know are not saved or you don't believe they're saved or maybe they're unchurched. And I encourage you to make a special effort. Invite them to come and experience uh, our time of worship together on next Sunday and on this coming Friday if you can during the noon hour I just thought about this this morning I was up early and just kind of felt led to do this for those who are able to do it here's what we're going to do we're going to have a service and for those who have lunch between that early time we're going to have a 11.30 time, a little something to eat because we want you to try to bring your friends. We're not going to ask them to fast. If they're not saved, they're not going to know what fasting is. So bring your friends and we'll have a little something for people to eat to stave off the hunger pains. And then we'll have a service start a little bit before 12 and we'll be through no later than 12.30. And then for those who have lunch at 12 o'clock, you come on over and you can deal with getting you a little something to eat and fellowship with your friends. And at 12.30, you can bring them in and we'll have a little time together and then we'll be through by 1 o'clock. And so our goal, basically, is to take this week when people are least thinking about Easter, seeing stuff on TV about the crucifixion, hearing things about Easter, and, and we do something on purpose this week to try to get people in a worship environment where they can hear the gospel clearly. And then hopefully, maybe get some of your unchurched friends, family members, co-workers to come out on Friday. Maybe you can get them to come back and be with us on Sunday morning. I don't want anyone to feel obligated this is of your own choice and will. I'm going to be here. I'm going to vote the whole day Friday, basically, to try to do something to connect with people with the gospel. If you can do that with your lunch arrangement, you come and bring your friends, and we'll see what God will do. Amen? Let's bow together, shall we?